Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks. That's good. You can keep looking at me anyway, so it's fine. You haven't got to worry about the camera. Yeah. Um, so hi, Joe. Give us your full name. Mohammed Yusuf Da D W A R. Brilliant. That is wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. So what I want to do today is I just want to find out about your particular journey from being a police officer in Tanganyika, uh, being a working at GEC, being a police officer in the UK, and then being a private investigator. Um, so first thing I want to ask you is, uh, where were you born? I was born in uh, Nairobi, Kenya. Okay. Uh -huh. And it, I, I've read, obviously, that you then moved to Tanganyika. What brought that about for yourself? Um, I was, my parents were already living in Tanganyika, uh, but my grandparents, they were in Kenya, Nairobi. So every time my mother was going to have a baby, she used to go to her mother's house. And that's how I was born and all my other brothers and sisters were all born in Nairobi, but we all lived in Tanzania. Okay. So for you, did you stay in Nairobi long then when you were a child or did you just, once you were born, you just came no, straight back? Just for a few months when she, I think, usually went for about five, six months and then returned back. So yeah. for you, so you were brought up in, what's correct, it, Tanganyika is it? Or? No, the, the, it's Tanganyika. 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 So for you, what was life like growing up in Tanganyika? Uh, Tanganyika was heaven on earth. That's how it was. It was a lovely place. The weather was beautiful and life was so easy. And you just seemed to grow up peacefully without any problems. What, what kind of things did you enjoy about it? Because obviously there's things like Mount Kilimanjaro, you've got the wildlife, you've got the markets. What, what for you really appealed for you growing up there? I don't know, yeah, it's a mixture of everything. Uh, Kilimanjaro, I've been right to the top. It was part of, of our training in the, with the police force that we had to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. The schools were all uh, like, uh, you could take any languages in there. You could take a Punjabi, you could have Urdu, have Gujarati, whatever you want. The basic medium was English. So we were all educated in English. But we had, you know, and with our friends, we could talk whatever language they were talking. Our Gujarati friends, we spoke in Gujarati with them. Punjabis were always Punjabis. And life was, you know, we were one big happy family there. For you, when did you, did you, what did you want to be when you were younger? Well, I've been reading <laughs> detective stories. Okay. And I always thought I wanted to be a detective. So when I finished my O level, um, I decided to join the police force. And uh, the headquarters was in Dar es Salaam, which is the capital city. I was in a small village called Arusha. So we to travel from Arusha to Dar es Salaam to go for this interview, which I did. And I passed the interview. Unfortunately, uh, when he asked my age, I was not 18, I was young, much younger than 18, about 17, 6. And he said, sorry, we can't take you because um, you have to be 18 years before you can join the training. But my interview went so well and he was so much impressed by me. He said, oh, don't worry, you start now and while you finish the training, you will be 18. So I, I became the youngest inspector in the history of the then Tanganyika Police Force. Wow. Yeah. Wow. The, the, the youngest. So you, you talk about books that you were inspired by. Were you thinking next James Bond spy as well? or? Uh... It wasn't. James Bond wasn't there in that time. <laughs> but the, with the detective stories, you know, um, enjoyed that. But then we had the training school, which was uh, in another town close to where I was, about 50 miles. That's where the police training school was. So as soon as uh, I passed the interview, they sent me to the training school. So I stayed there six months, got trained, and then they finally sent us back to headquarters in Dar es Salaam. 
stayed there a couple of weeks doing another training and from there we were distributed to various parts of Tanganyika. At that time I happened to go to Monza which was another city and I stayed two years there in Monza doing the police job. So this was without your family, this was just by yourself? Just, yeah, I was a bachelor then, not yeah. married. So where, where would you stay? Would it be in police accommodation? Yeah, yeah, we stayed in everywhere. They had police accommodation and we stayed in mm -hmm. the police houses. So what was that first day? What, can you, do you remember what the uniform was that you wore? The uniform as a, as a trainee, we, you know, it was more of a constable uniform, not an inspector's uniform. So you had a sort of a pea cap, a grey t-shirt or a shirt, and then shorts. We always wear shorts there. So what kind of a peaked cap was it, did you say? Or no, it was like a round cap. A round cap, Not a beret? The, yeah. Yeah. Oh, do you, what colour was that? Was that? Uh, khaki. Okay, yeah. so it was that. And what was that feeling like for you the first day that you put it on? Were you, were you kind of wearing it with pride or were you going... Oh my gosh, what am I wearing? No, no, yeah, I had the pride because I was selected, I was there for the training and I knew the training would be only for six months and then you'll be into an inspector's uniform. Oh, so straight, that quickly before you became an inspector? Yes. I'm just when you finish the training, you become the inspector. Okay. Yeah. So how different was the inspector's uniform or what was added to the inspector's uniform? What? Inspector was much smarter. <laughs> okay. Um, you had again the tunic, complete tunic, either shorts or trousers, and you have the badges and everything. It looked much smarter. So, did you have a routine, you know, when you put on your uniform, where you go, I'm putting this on first, then I'm putting that on next? I, did you have a routine, or did you just I'll quickly put on whatever you wanted to? Well, it depended, you know, what time the duty was. <laughs> If you had short time, then you rush and get it in. And if you had more time, you'll take your time and get ready. Yeah. But, but there was no set kind of routine in terms of doing no, that. No. In, in terms of like with the, uh, the the tunic that you were wearing, were there buttons on it? Were there kind yes, of? Yes, there were buttons all with Tengadika police written on it. There was a whistle, and uh, those time we didn't have much. You know, the whistle or the truncheon; those were, were two weapons. That's all. Okay. Yeah. So, with with the truncheon itself, was that was that kind of quite similar to the the British truncheon that you yes. later found out, or was it kind of quite different, almost like a stick? No, it was similar to that. Uh -huh. Similar to. I had, was that quite a thin truncheon in those days, or was that? No, it was quite thick. Thick. Yes. Uh -huh. It was very thick. Uh -huh. And did you ever have to use it? No. 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 Just yeah. Uh, just used your, your words to calm people down. Yeah, that's it. So when, when you became the inspector, again, you so you must have been one of the youngest inspectors ever. Yeah. Another first? Another, I think so, another first in yeah. those days, but because we didn't have that kind of records anywhere. It is what, uh, you know, uh, the, what was the commandant told me in my interview, because he was reluctant to take me in because I was six months younger than 18, which was the age they used to take us in. And then when he told me, it's okay, you'll be all right in there. After the six months training, you would have achieved 18 years old, and that's, that's okay for, by me. Wow. It was the interview that really impressed him. Really impressed him. Yeah. So you, you mentioned that the equipment that you had was, you had a whistle? Yes. Uh, was that a metal or plastic or what? And a metal whistle. A, me a metal whistle. Yeah. Uh, you had a, your trencher. Yeah. And did you have a notebook? Was that your kind of... No, we didn't have notebooks in those times. No? No. So, so it, when, if there was a crime reported yeah. as such, what was the routine or what was the, the process? The routine was, you know, you, whoever you get, you bring them to the station and then you sit down and do the reports, interviews and things like that. And that's where you would make the notes? Yes. And did, you were using pencil then? Or... Uh, big pens, I think. Big, the, yeah. Oh, big pens yeah. in, in that particular time itself. Yeah. So if you were patrolling, I don't know, did, as an inspector, what did your role entail? Was it more a case of managing where you were and managing other people, or was it actually going out? Yeah, uh, as an inspector, uh, my, first, my first transfer was in Monza. And there I became in charge of uh, 
the shift in the in the in the in the police station. There are three shifts, so each shift has an inspector in charge, and they had a sergeant and few constables underneath them. Okay. So that's how it. And my very first case, because we were we were trained as inspectors, but practically we didn't have the knowledge. So we had to depend on the sergeants and the constables to learn from them in practice what should be done and shouldn't be done. Oh, okay. Uh, my first case when I was in uh, in Monza, I was in the police station, and this man walked in with his left hand in his right hand, <laughs> and he put it on the counter. <laughs> I looked at it and I was shocked. And uh, then I asked the sergeant, I said, what do you do? He said, oh, well, you just give him a medical form and give it to him and tell him to go to hospital. I said, but hospital is about two miles from here. You can't just, can't we take him in police car or anything? He said, just ask him where he's come from. So I asked him, where are you from? He said, Bukumbi, which was about 12 miles from the police station. He said, has he walked from there? He said, yes. He said, if he can walk 12 miles, another two miles won't hurt him. Gosh. <laughs> That's how it was. A hand on the counter. Yeah. Somebody has cut his hand because I think they get drunk there and they have a fight. Did, did you have to investigate that or was that was that the end of the matter? You kind of like... No, because, uh, the, the next day shift, because this was in the evening, and the next day shift, day takeover, and whoever can go down because you knew who has done it. So whoever was there to take over the next shift and go and find person. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have to deal with any animals, animal cases? Because Yeah, that was later on after, after becoming in charge of the station. Um, because I was young, another officer decided to take me under his wings called Mr. Rhys Davis. He was a terror for traffic offences and um, he was known throughout Tanganyika for being strict. And So with traffic offences, this is a motoring driving? Motoring it, driving. Oh, motoring driving. Yeah, like a whole traffic section. And he was in charge of that traffic section. And then I joined the traffic branch. So I worked with him for two years and he taught me all about traffic driving and everything. And from there, from Monza, I got a transfer to Arusha, which my own hometown. So with the traffic offences, what, what kind of offences would people get? Speeding or driving? Speeding, drive? well, there was very little speeding because most of the speeding there was uh, done by constables who had were on the motorbikes. Okay. And they used to follow you for a distance on their speedometer and see whether you're driving or not. We had mostly stolen cars or um, accidents and things like that. I used to have here to go and investigate all the accidents, find out whose fault it is, and then you have to take them to court, charge them. You used to be the prosecutor. As well, you were yeah. the prosecutor as well? The prosecutor as well. You had to go there. And, uh, so you kind of almost had a double role, not only in terms of being a police officer, then you went and pros prosecuted them as well. Yeah. And so you were standing up in court before a judge presenting yeah. your case. Yeah. And prior to that, you know, even, even if we had to go and investigate something, uh, it wasn't very as easy as we had here in UK. In UK, if there was a murder here, in about 10 minutes or half an hour, they'll set up a police, like a police station. They will call scene of crime people, camera people, and investigating officers. You have a team of 50, 100, 200 people there. But in Tanzania, when there was a murder, you go to the scene. It took you about two to three days to reach the scene. By the time you go there, the body is half eaten behind us. You only got the half the body. You go there, you're the cameraman. You are the uh, crime of scene expert, investigator, everything. You stay there in the bush for a couple of weeks, find the culprit, arrest them and bring them back. How, I mean, do you have a case of whereby, how easy was it to get the culprit? Was it, did the communities talk? Did 
Are you talking about, when you're talking about going out into the bush, talking to tribal leaders or is this... Yes, that, yeah. that's how it was. You talk to the people, you talk to the tribal people and they were very helpful. You know, if they known what, uh, the police is looking for somebody, they will find the person for you and bring them to you. They say, this is your culprit. And you sit down there, make take statements there, whatever, complete the case and then bring them. So was language ever a barrier? Because I... I, I there's quite a lot of different tribes. There's not like one or two. Yeah, there's most of the people they spoke the local language, which was Swahili. Okay. Yeah. So after when I came back from Monza to Arusha, uh, that was my hometown, I found out there was a vacancy in a stop theft preventive unit, which I applied to join and I managed to get in. Now what was happening in this unit, they were strictly dealing with cattle thefts. Because of all these tribes, for them money, and wealth, everything was the cattle. So one tribe would probably, or one individual would go and steal cattle. From and this is from a farmer or from? No, from the tribal. tribal oh, from people, other tribes. Other tribes. They'll steal the cattle and then either the same people whose cattle is stolen, they'll follow the track and they'll reach for the track and reach into the village where the tracks have sort of lost. So it is the responsibility of that village to find out whether where the cattle has gone. They, to prove themselves innocent, they will have to find the track further leading to another village or call the police and get the police involved. He said, this is where the cattle and the tracks ended. Now it is their responsibility. So it was your job to start investigating, find out, um, find the culprit, arrest them, get the witnesses. If you are there for a week, two weeks, you have to feed them all and go and shoot. Oh, you would have to feed the yeah. tribe? Yes, because we had to go and do some sh shooting, <laughs> kill some deers or something and distribute the meat so they are there. And would you, would you have to kill the deer then or would you have yes. to get... So you had a gun as well then? Yes, I had the gun, police gun, and I used to... So you, so, <laughs> this is like crazy. So you, 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 not only are you talking about doing everything, you're doing, talking about doing extra things yeah. where you were a huntsman. Yeah, because as I said, it was very difficult. By the time you reach the scene, it take you two or three days, traveling there in the, in the Land Rover. So when, when you get there, you can't just leave everything and come back. You have to sort it all out. Now tribal clash, always used to be tribal clashes because as, we, as soon as they have seen, the tr they have followed the tracks, gone to another village and people in the village now, they all get together. They want to know where their cattle is. If they can't find the cattle, they probably start uh, many fighting between themselves. So for that reason, the, the, this stop that preventive unit was made. Before, prior to this, they had a field force there and that field force was a big group and every time they had to go out, they had to take 10, 15 vehicles, about 50, 60 people. So they used to go to the scene and by the time they go there, everything was settled, dispersed and the government had wasted a lot of time. So what they did was they formed this new unit and they trained them and gave them all the necessary equipment to stay in the bush for several days. Uh, the main man in charge was um, somebody from Scotland, Mr. Keynes, and uh, under him there was a South African, Mr. Baker. So when I joined them, uh, it was coming to the independence and they both knew that they would have to leave and go. So what they did, they trained me. Okay. Mr. Baker, who was a more operational man in the field, he taught me all the tricks to do the operations, how to investigate, how to talk to them. Mr. Kane was administrator, he knew all how to write all the reports and everything. So I so, learned from yeah. both of them. Hmm. And our commandant, you know, obviously they don't want to go out in the bush middle of the night or stay two, three days. So they put the responsibility on my shoulder so I could go and do work on their behalf, but still bring back the results. So where would you sleep? You would sleep in, in the, used to in the have Land Rover? Tent, yeah, in, in the Land Rover we have a tent. We had um, 
literally folding chairs. We had a fridge as well, radio. The, the only thing we had for communication was the radio. This is a radio with a big area on the Land Rover. So was it quite scary in the sense of, say you've gone into a village and they may have taken the cattle. Obviously they're going to be quite hostile towards you, deny yes. everything, almost threaten you without threatening you. That must have been quite a difficult situation. It was, it was very, very difficult, especially, you know, when the proof was there and they would, the other party wouldn't agree to anything and then they would start a clash and they get, what they did was get several villages to take their side and the other party will have other villages. So instead of where there's only about 50, 60 people in all, you got about two, 300 people this side, another two, 300 feet. So you are literally sitting between a war, between the tribal clash between two. You're so in the middle. Was, yeah, you're <laughs> in the middle. So it was your job to stop them. So and you, how, did you, how did you manage to kind of well, most of the time, you know, you start talking to the elders because everybody listened to the elders. Sorry so, to interrupt. Yeah, no, come on, come on in, auntie, come on. Yeah, you gaping now, I said, oh, who work on the air, then you said, oh, bajade. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 that'd be great, thank you. Then, just leave it. So, so, you, so you're saying you're the tribes on both sides and you're there in the middle? Yeah. And if you think that things are really going to go bad, that's what was the communication of a radio, car radio, and then you ask for help. And then the field force will come down. Not necessarily the same day. <laughs> Not necessarily take two, three days, but uh, well, you were there. So but, when you were investigating, so obviously, if say that the trail had taken you to one village and then there, there's no cattle, because you can't see you can't see any other trail. How did you go about? Did it, were you, you know, In tracking? Those days we, no, no, because we, it was the responsibility of that second village where the tracks ended. Okay. And if they couldn't find, you know, the tracks, they will have to send their scouts out to see where where the cattle have gone or who has taken. Yeah. If they found the culprit, they will arrest him and bring it to you. And say these are the people. They had to admit there. Did people ever give you strange explanations? <laughs> Aliens came. It's, a, it's very difficult to admit these things. But uh, Mr. Baker taught me how to get a confession from, um, from these people. From uh, the main tribe of the Maasai. Maasais. And, um, you know, when I came here first, uh, when I had a culprit or suspect, you sit down with him, you offer him a cup of tea and things like that. But up there, it wasn't like that. As soon as you you come, come across, your constables have arrested this man and brought him, he said, he's the suspect. So I go up there to him. I have a gun in my hand, the old rifle, and we just hit him with the butt, straight. <laughs> and then he starts talking. Okay. And if you wouldn't talk, the Mr. Baker had dug a very big hole and there were snakes in the hole. So you tie him up and put him down that hole. And even if he's only gone about five yards in the hole, he will start speaking. Not only about that particular theft, but all the other thefts he's done in his life. Gosh. That's how the life the confession. Is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh... So, as you say, it was part of the training and something yeah. that you, uh, you were taught. I, in the snake pit, as such, uh, were there poisonous snakes or...? Most, I don't think they were poisonous. Okay. But, uh, you know, but they were there to scare the Maasai and uh, they don't like that kind of... Gosh. What, what about in terms of your own interaction? Did you then start mixing with the, the tribal chiefs? Were, chiefs? were they always helpful? Or yes, were... they were very helpful. Yeah. Just in terms of providing information and what have you? Yes, because yeah. I, we put the responsibility on them, being the tribal chiefs. I said, this is your responsibility. I've come up to here. Uh, this is your responsibility you have to find. Uh, as I said. So what would, what would happen then? So say you've gone to the village and it's clear that the, the, the cattle is here in this village. Yeah. 
do they either return the stock back but if there's no stock do they give them financial compensation what, yeah. what would happen then we had the courts the, the local courts in that village it's a small court where uh, you know you take the matter into the court and let the the head of that village they decide what the punishment is going to be if they are to be sent to prison then we have to take it with us and say to prison and otherwise if there's any compensation matter they finish it there oh. Okay. If it wasn't, if, if uh, there was no smaller court, then I would bring him back to the nearest big town there and take him there and, uh, you know, start the proceedings there. And we had to, to be <laughs> lawyers there. I so, didn't say, so, so in, the, in the small local courts, were you, were you prosecuting yeah. again then? Yeah, we were prosecuting. You, so you'd go, this is the evidence that I found, yeah. this is what's here, and so it clearly yeah. points that the trail... Yeah point yeah. to this particular village to, itself. Before, uh, most case courts we used to go, we used to do this in English, but then there has to be interpreters and things like that. But then to save time, we would prosecute in Swahili, because that was the language we were all speaking there. And just take it to the court and see what the outcome is. Yeah. Did, the, did you have you know, in the UK, there's that thing, I'm, I'm arresting you or I'm charging you. Was there a similar thing that you may have said in Swahili or even in English? Or was it just no, a case of your I, I don't think, I, we didn't have anything like that. Yeah. Just and, you're being arrested. Yeah, and that's it, yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you, is it Jumbo it's to say hello? Yeah, yeah it's just to say hello there, Jumbo. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And uh, how, many commu how many different tribes were there the, in... Well, there are lots of tribes, you know, and it it all depended. Certain Maasai's, you know, in, in the north, the Maasai's were very popular and they were everywhere. And then you, as you go away further, but uh, the cattle theft were mostly between the Maasai's. They were the ones, and anybody, any other tribe, if they had the cattle and if they had that kind of a problem, they wouldn't go to follow the tracks, they will come straight to the police and say this is our problem and we will take it over for them because they they couldn't afford to have fights between tribes there. What was the reason behind the cat cattle theft? Was it was it bravery, bravado, was it the money, survival or yeah? I think a cattle was a money kind of thing, you know, in those tribes. The wealth of everybody was uh, considered from the amount of cattle they had. And even when they got married, they had to give cattle <laughs> away as a dowry. Okay. Yeah. And even for their food or milk and things like that, they needed the cattle. So cattle was their whole life, the whole money and everything. Okay. So, so hence it had a lot of value uh, yeah. in terms of... So in terms if of somebody it. stole it either for food or to sell it further, uh -huh. That's how the clashes started. Do you know what type of cattle it was? In this it's area? cows and goats and okay. mostly mostly cows. Okay. Do you, what type of cows? Do you, do you happen to know what the name or what type? Free? No. That, oh, no, I just thought, just in case. Did you ever come across a case whereby, in terms of the cattle theft, it's clear that the cattle has left, but then there's no, it hasn't gone to a village? Did, were, there, were there borders where you kind of, oh, it's crossed the border. No, it hasn't crossed the border. Were there clear distinctive points? So it's, it's almost like, well, we don't know where the cattle's gone. It, it's gone to the edge of the cliff and then it's vanished. Yeah, this is many times happened, but we had to, you know, sit down with the elders and talk to them. And, you know, try to explain to them that we'll be looking, you know, and it will be investigations will carry on. And if you find something come back to us and that way how we cool down the matter. Mm -hmm. What did you enjoy there uh, in Tanzania in being a police uh, inspector? Uh, what, what was good for you? Uh, I don't know. So it was a life itself, you know, it was so easy going life. I know I work hard. We used to work 24 hours a day. For us, 